Proverbs chapter 1. This book, I mean, it kind of wraps up in, in verse 1. It says, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. This is the book of God's wisdom placed in your lap, in your hands. And uh, it's a very practical book. So many people are looking for wisdom. You know, the number one prayer request I get would you pray for wisdom? We, we're in this situation. We don't know what to do. And we need to, you know. And this is the book. This is where you get the answers to all of those things. It's very personal and very practical. And, and this book gets right down into the trenches of life with us. And uh, gives us some daily lessons, you know. So it's basically the how to live the Christian life in a fallen world. That's what this book is. It's written in Hebrew poetry, and Hebrew poetry isn't, isn't this rhyming, rhythmic thing that, that we Americans are used to. Hebrew poetry is, is interesting. You know, it's not Mary had a little lamb, or, or roses are red and violets are blue, and you look funny, and, you know, so do you. Yeah, so whatever. Uh, Hebrew poetry is, is interesting. It has this idea of comparing ideas like in Proverbs 17:22. A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. You know, it, it has this contrasting thing. It's, it's also um, ha, can be sermon-like in some of its passages. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without a cause? Who has redness of the eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Some of us have been there, you know, we know what that's like. Goes on to describe the drunkard, you know, condition and the bed spinning and, you know, all of that stuff. And it's like, yeah, I've been there. I, I, I should understand that proverb, right? Then there are little couplets, you know, two little lines or two little verses that go hand in hand together. You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And then you have the completive, the, the single line things that are complete in themselves. You know, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. So you have this idea of poetry that we've got to kind of get used to, you know, as Americans. But... Uh, it's wisdom. And wisdom is different than knowledge. I don't know if you know that. Wisdom is actually knowledge applied correctly. And the key word is applied. So many people want to come and pray for wisdom. Oh, give me wisdom, Lord. But it's the application where wisdom actually takes place. It's when you move. It's when you do. It's when you act. That's the wisdom part. And... Uh, it's the who, what, when, where, why, and how of life. Now, our fallen culture, you know, the world around us tells you knowledge is power. And if that was true, everybody with a PhD would be these amazing, powerful people in the world, but they are not. You know, they're flipping burgers at McDonald's, and they're, they're gaming in mom's basement somewhere. You know, they've gone through college, they've got their PhD, but there was no power in that knowledge. That didn't happen. But, you know, according to Buckminster Fuller, knowledge, since 2,000 years ago, knowledge has basically doubled every 100 years till World War II. In World War II, it started doubling about every 25 years. And today... It's doubling about every 13 months. And according to IBM, it's going to be doubling every 12 hours very shortly. Can you imagine that? Just knowledge being doubled. You know, you have access to more information on your computer, on the internet, on TV, than a guy, than a Puritan did 200 years ago when they founded America in his whole life. You have more information today than he got in his whole life. <laughs> but without wisdom to put that knowledge to work, it's worthless. 
It's just a bunch, oh, you'll win trivia, trivial pursuit. You might be great at that, <laughs> but you may fail at life, you know. If you're anything like me, you, you tried to figure everything out on your own. You know, I left home when I was 17 years old. I got married. I, whew, I'm out of there. I'm going to go figure this thing out. And, and uh, we call that the school of hard knocks. And that's not always the uh, easy, best, or most pleasant way to learn things. Oh, well, you can learn some stuff that way. But man, it will beat you up. This is God's on online course for you. Online, you, you don't have to engage. You, you don't have to go out there and be beat up by the world. You can learn it sitting in the comfort of your easy chair at home. You can learn this wisdom and bring it into your mind. And so I, I like the idea of that. You know, we have more knowledge about what, it, what it's like to be a good father and a good husband than any people ever to live on planet earth and yet we do a worse job at it we have the idea more information about what a mother and what a wife should look like but we blow it all the time we know more about our health and our fitness and yet we are the least healthy culture you ever wonder about that well, what's going on there we know more about the effects of drugs and alcohol on bodies and on people than any other culture to ever live. You would think with all of that information, not a single person had run down that path. Yet our culture is plagued by people running down that path. Why? Lack of wisdom. That's the whole thing. The problem with our culture, the problem with, you know, our neighborhoods, and the problem probably with us in our households isn't a lack of knowledge. <laughs> it's a lack of wisdom, what to do with that knowledge. It's rightly applying that knowledge to our lives, not to our neighbors. Uh, jerk, if he would just do this, can't he see he's being stupid? If he would just fix that. It's funny, we have all kinds of wisdom for other people. We just don't bring it into the mirror. Look at us. This book will supply us with wisdom for every area of life you will ever encounter. <laughs> And all you need to become wise is to read it and apply it. That's all you need. So he gives us the introduction in verses 2 through 7. It says, To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, and to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will obtain wise counsel, to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise men and their riddles. Now Solomon, the guy who wrote all but the last two chapters of this book, he was the third king of Israel, he was gifted with a gift from God that made him the wisest man ever, including presently, according to the word of God. He was raised by King David after his Bathsheba experience, you know, after he was broken and humbled. Great godly influence. He, he was, he was uh, mentored by a guy named Nathan. Again, great godly influence upon this young guy. He spoke some 3,000 parables. We have a couple of hundred here that were God-breathed. Now, I want you to notice something in, in verses 2, in verse 3, in verse 4, it says to know, to perceive, to receive, to give. Here's the purpose of this book, you know. <laughs> it's all of these actions it's the who, what, when, where, why, and how of life. Who do I turn to in this situation? 
What am I going to do when this happens? How, how does all of that work out? Where will this lead me? Why am I going to do this? All of those questions right here. All of those answers right here. So verse 2 begins in the Hebrew to know. And literally it's, it's foreknowing wisdom. Foreknowing wisdom. To be in the pre in the present condition of constantly learning about wisdom. That should be our goal, and that's what this book is all about. It's not like you, you learn wisdom, oh, I got wise, and now I walk through life. It's you're constantly learning wisdom and walking through life. It's this process. Instruction, it says, to know wisdom and instruction is literally discipline. You guys need to learn discipline. Because if you're going to put anything in this book into your life, that requires discipline. The world's telling me to go run this way, and it's telling me to go that way. But God's Word says stop and do this. and uh, It takes discipline to do what God tells you to do instead of what the world is telling you to do. Verse 3, to receive the instruction of wisdom. This book will supply you with practical instruction. You'll be able to perceive God's wisdom for life. You know, it can be very frustrating when you've gotten yourself into a pickle. You've made some bad choices, bad decisions. You find yourself in this place, and you go to somebody, some expert. How do I get out? What do I do? How do I change my situation? And they give you some philosophical stuff. No, I need to know what and how and who. That's this book, the what and the how and the who. It also tells us about justice. What's right? What is righteous? You're going to learn that in this book. It tells us about judgment, how to judge properly. Oh, you're not supposed to judge, Mark. Sorry, I'm in the Bible. It says to judge. And what does equity look like? What's fair and what's unfair? It's going to give you that. Verse 4, to give prudence to the simple. Aren't you glad it says that? Because I am. Because I'm kind of one of them simple people. And I'm, I'm glad it's going to give me something. You know, it literally refers to the naive person. One who is inexperienced in life. It allows us to learn life lessons without walking through them in life. You don't have to go out there and get abused and beat up and broken and bruised before you can go, oh, man. I finally learned a little wisdom through that, you know, because most people who are street smart are not very smart. Sorry, did, did I, I'm sorry that came out. It, we can learn how to walk through this hard life wisely without diving in and trying everything to figure out which way is the right way to go. It supplies the young man with knowledge and discretion. Think about this. It supplies the guy with no life experience how to plan, how to make good decisions, how to make right choices. This book supplies that. Verse 6, to understand a proverb. Well, we're in Proverbs. It's a good thing you can learn how to understand those, right? But you guys already know Proverbs, right? A stitch in time saves nine. You know. And isn't it funny? We know Proverbs. We're familiar with Proverbs. They're usually short and sweet and easy to memorize. They make it perfectly clear. That's, that's what we're going to go through. And an enigma. An enigma. Isn't that funny? He says... There are some hidden things. There are some hard things in life. There are some tough lessons out there. <laughs> and this, a book, this book allows you to take what is unclear. These hidden and hopeless things in life. 
And in one sentence sometimes, God's wisdom can come right off the page and make it perfectly clear what you're dealing with. And you go, oh, look at that, it's right there, it's so simple. I was thinking it was this big jumbled mess, I'd never get through it, and yet right here, just, hey, don't do that. Hey, walk this way. Hey, open that door and not that door. So as we sit here this morning, in your lap, is the single greatest source of wisdom ever given on planet Earth. Will you apply it? That's our question. So in verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the key to the entire book. The fear of the Lord. This book will only yield its wisdom to the one who fears God. Everything must begin right there. Because without that basis, these words, you'll read them and they'll stay right there on the page. They won't come into your heart. You won't begin to use them or weigh them against the world and let them outweigh what the world is telling you, you'll simply say, well, everybody else is doing it this way and that's the way it's got to be. But when you have the fear of the Lord, when you have this great awe and respect for God, when you know that he loves you, and when you know that he's a father, and a father that loves you, that's great, but he's also a father that isn't afraid to take you to the woodshed and whoop you. You see, when I grew up, I had the fear of my father. And you could tell by the way he pulled in the driveway, do I need to go to my room or down the street to Alan's house? You know, what do I need to do? Because there could be some problems walking in the door here any minute. And I had this awe. I reverenced my father because he earned that respect from me. But my father was 350 pounds. He was 6'4". He could load a snow machine in the back of your truck with one hand because that's all he had. he just pick it up and throw it in there. And we would sit around and look at him and go, don't mess with him. You see, buried inside the fear of the Lord is actual fear sometimes. I don't want to make him mad. Think of all the people that you know who have vast amounts of knowledge. Information all over the time, all over the place, and even some wisdom. But do they obey that wisdom through their life? You know, sometimes, you know, they, they come out kind of this way. Well, I'm, I'm a self-made man, I made myself, I make my own rules, I walk my own path, I'm gonna make my own choices. And at the end of life, you know, their life is a mess and they can't figure out why. You know, in Proverbs 8, 13, it says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. You wanna know what the fear of the Lord looks like? It's to hate evil. It's to hate pride. Oh, what was that guy? Oh, sorry. It's to hate arrogance and the evil way. The fear of the Lord knows that there is lines drawn in the sand and we should not cross those lines. Our world doesn't know that today. Everything's open, everything's free. Question everything. The greatest example of what it looks to be wise or to have knowledge and have wisdom but have a ruined life is Solomon himself. If you've ever read the Bible, you know Solomon. When he was young and pliable, he learned from the Lord. He was under the Lord's tutelage. He wrote these books of Proverbs. He, he, he did all of this stuff. He was a great guy, but when he got older, when he became an adult, he decided you know, I'm going to try all of this stuff just to see if it works out. Instead of using wisdom, he walked down the unwise path. He backslid most of his adult life. 
He's a man that possessed mountains of wisdom but applied none of it to his own life. There are a lot of people around. I know people that can quote the Bible inside out and backwards. They make me look like a pauper, you know. They have this knowledge, this wisdom, this, all of this stuff, but they never apply it to this thing. There is an absence of the fear of the Lord in their life. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. That book's just full of whatever. That, that doesn't really mean what it means or what it says. What does the fear of the look like? Fear of the Lord look like? It looks like a deep, deep reverence for God and for His Word. It looks like awe. It looks like somebody who chooses to obey His Word. That's what the fear of the Lord looks like. Psalm 128, 1, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. There's the fear of the Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's the fear of the Lord. How do you know if you reverence God, if you have him in awe? How do you know if you have this fear of the Lord? You're going to apply these things to your life. That's how you know. So verse 8 it says, my, my son, and, and for, you know, the first 20 chapters of this book, we're going to hear my son, my son, my son, my child, my children. You know, this is the picture of a father and a mother, a godly parents sitting down with their children and giving them wisdom, giving them instruction. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. I like it because it assumes there's a godly father and a godly mother training up this child. And he says, listen, hear. In my book, it means hearken. It means listen to change. Listen to go that direction. Listen, pay attention. You know, it's like when you get the VCR and the things flash in 12. You pick up that manual, you don't want anything to do with that instruction manual, right guys? You don't want it, but you have to pick it up to figure out how to get the stupid thing, and what do you do? You're reading to find the instruction to change something. That's what it says here. Listen with that heart. Listen to the instruction, the discipline of your father. Now, here's the father's role. The father is to be the authority figure in the house. Some of you guys don't like that, don't care. Setting rules, setting standards, applying discipline. And then it says, and do not disregard the rules, the law of your mother. You know, I remember as a kid, anytime mom would have to carry out discipline, we would sit in our rooms and kind of laugh. Oh boy, mom's going to spike us. Woohoo, you know. And you know, because she couldn't apply it. But as soon as she said, as soon as she walked in and caught us fooling around and laughing about it, she would say, I'll just tell your dad. Oh, now it wasn't fun anymore. That was not very wise of us, right? <laughs> I used to tell my boys, I said, you know, boys, you're getting older, you're kind of being rascals with your mom. I said, you can treat your mom any way you want. Really? Yep. But just remember, that girl sitting over there, she's my wife, and nobody disrespects my wife. Not in my house. It changed my boys a lot. Because they stopped seeing her as just mom. Mom's a joke. Mom's a whatever. Suddenly it's like, but if you tick her off, dad's going to hear, and dad's coming home. Just lost my place, sorry. So verse 9, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. If you accept your parents' role in your life, if you take in their teachings, their rules, their stuff, your parents' parents' 
tutelage in your life beautifies your life. As you walk through this life, you have ornaments on you that speak of your character that you learned when you were a child. Our modern equivalent is beauty is only skin deep. Because what that means is we all know there's a deeper beauty than that. Because beauty is going to fade, right? Good looks are going to pass. But that there's something inside that won't. You know, I've met some beautiful people in my day. And then tried to get to know them. So I walk up and start to talk to them. And stuff comes out. And suddenly you're like, ooh, that's not such a beautiful person anymore. You know, I was judging one way, and suddenly here comes all of this stuff, and I need to reevaluate my definition of beauty. We are to be recognizing the God given authority in our lives. I didn't choose to be born to you or to him. You're right. God chose that for you. God given authority, God given position, you know. The book of Proverbs can give us a deep internal beauty when we pack it around. It's how we act. It's how we treat each other. It's, the way, it's way deeper than skin deep. Our culture is focused on the outward. You guys know that, right? All the health spas and the beauty makeup, and we spend billions of dollars a year on trying to fix the outward appearance of this thing, you know? What beauty really matters? Character, inward. That's what really matters. That's what really shines. And you get that a few minutes every morning in the Word of God. That's where you get that. I never remember a time where my parents sat down and gave me instruction. Not one time about anything in life. And I probably failed in that with my kids, too. I don't know what it's like. You know, when I left the home, I was prepared to fail. That's what I was prepared for. If you have parents that are trying to teach you, trying to train you, trying to give instruction to you, you are so blessed. You are light years ahead of where I was when I walked out of my house light years ahead. If you're young and just getting started, here's my advice. Pick up this book and read a proverb a day for the rest of your life. It will never prove empty or worthless. Or oh boy, I wish I hadn't have wasted my time doing that. So in verse 10, my son, if sinners entice you do not consent to them. If they say, come with us and let us lie in wait and shed blood, let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. You know, here comes the warning. You're going to have some peers. You're going to have some group of guys or girls or they want to they bring you into the group. You know, literally, you find the gang culture mentioned right here. We'll watch out for you. We'll take care of you now. You don't need the mom and dad thing. We got you. We'll walk you through this thing. You know, and it's very seductive. Is there anybody in here that doesn't want to belong to that group? These group actually think I'm smart. They want me. They hang out and do the things I want to do. You know, that's very seductive. I don't care who you are. It says in verse 12, they say, let us swallow them alive like Sheol, like, like hell, and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our homes with the spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. This is very tempting. Here's this young man being drawn into this group, into this crowd, and they're like, come. Come on, we got all this stuff. Man, don't waste your time working at McDonald's, flipping burgers for $7 an hour when you could come deal for us. 
You could come hang out with us, be one of us, and you'd be driving that new Camaro in no time. You'd be having that big screen TV and that, that gaming stuff and all of that stuff. It'll be right there for the taking. <laughs> this is very powerful pull on everybody in our culture. So it says in verse 15, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. And here's God's warning. Here's wisdom. Don't go that way. Don't walk with them. <laughs> Sometimes, as a Christian, you have to stand alone. Not stand with the crowd, not stand with the popular people, not stand wherever. You have to stand alone. You know, this proverb was written 3,000 years ago and it's still true today. Crime doesn't pay. And it doesn't. Oh, Mark, you don't know. I know some people, man. They're scoring big and they got all kinds of stuff. Well, you haven't seen the end of their life, have you? But I have because I've read the book. I know how it finishes. There is one ultimate reality and there is one ultimate judge who they will stand before at the end of this life and they will give an account. So verse 17, surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. <laughs> I love this idea because, you know, you take your big trap out there and you place it right down there. The bird's over there on the fence watching you and you open that baby up and you put the seeds in there and you do all of this stuff. That bird isn't going anywhere near that thing. But people are so much smarter than birds, right? Because it says here, We've warned them, crime doesn't pay. We've warned them, hey, don't murder, don't rape, don't abuse, don't use, don't do all of these things. And where do they run? Right to those things. And they set their own trap and they're caught in their own trap. Who's the bird brain? It's not the bird, it's us humans. Verse 18, but they lie in wait for their own blood and they lurk secretly for their own lives, reaping and sowing going on here. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owner. Go to the prisons. Go ask the inmates. And when they tell you the truth, study their lives. Did they really live? when they were living or were they on the run? Every time a police car drove by, they were <gasps> Every time there was a knock on the door, you expected somebody? Is that life? Is that a living? The word of God says you can warn people and warn people and warn people and they're still going to do it anyway. That's what the word of God says. So verse 20, Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open square. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the openings of the gates in the city, she speaks her word. Wisdom, wisdom personified as a woman in this verse. Maybe even as a mother, you might think of it. She's calling out to the whole world. And, and literally it says, come to me, gain wisdom from me. Every place there's a decision to be made, every doorway, every opening, every major concourse, every place that you make decisions, wisdom is speaking to you. Come, come listen to me. Come take heed of me. <laughs> but our world is indifferent to her cry. I want to do it my way. I want to do what I want to do. Isn't that so sad? Every opportunity Wisdom's calling. Yet today it remains largely rejected and ignored. 
You know. You know when you're preparing to go out and do something you shouldn't go do. You're getting dressed, you go shower, you're washing your car, you're doing whatever it is, you're preparing to go out and do something wrong. You know that voice is talking to you. You know it is. You've all heard it. And you've all ignored it at times, haven't you? <laughs> How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Now, a scorner is one who rejects God's wisdom, just outright. I don't need to listen to that. I'm going to live my own life. I, I'm going to do fine. Because they love the sin that they're involved in. A fool here is the person who actually believes they have a wisdom that is equal or greater than God's. I can outthink him. I can outmaneuver this. I can get away with that. So verse 23, turn at my rebuke. Turn, what's that mean? Repent, right? Change your mind. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. Listen to the grace of this. This is someone who's being rejected and rejected and rejected, and yet wisdom says, man, if you'll just turn to me, I'll open my word to you. I'll pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. That, that's amazing grace going on there. I'm so glad when I was running hell-bent for leather in this life that God stepped in and called me up short and got my attention and broke me and saved my worthless hide. I am so glad he did that. Wisdom crying out in the streets. Now here comes the warning. Because I have called out to you and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one has regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes upon you. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, God's word will laugh at you then. This is poetic justice. Those who reject God's wisdom, when the consequences come around of what they've been playing with, what they've been messing with, wisdom laughs. We speak of, in our culture of somebody having the last laugh. Oh, I'm going to get the last laugh. No, God always has the last laugh. Her warning, those who reject me, those who think they have a way around my wisdom, those ways will always lead to a crash and a burn. And I'm going to be standing there watching you. Verse 28, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. Here's the tables have turned. They've acted and they lived without God's word, without his wisdom, without his forethought. And now they find themselves in this terrible place. Oh, I'm going to prison. It's my third DUI. I thought I could get away with it. I thought I was smarter, but no, I can't do it. Or, you know, whatever it is. And that's when they turn, oh, God, save me. But it's too late. Now, it's not too late for salvation. It's too late to get out of your consequences. I've seen God save people in all kinds of circumstances. But I've seen God let circumstances roll over those people. He, does ne he, he never promises to save you from your circumstance. He only promises... If you come to him, he'll be with you through the circumstance. Now understand this, as Christians, guys, 
God is never going to turn away from you. That's our promise. We turn to this book. We, we ask him. We pray like James. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all willingly. Doesn't upbraid. Doesn't go, you didn't listen last time. He doesn't do that to us. He just keeps giving us wisdom. God will always provide to us. But there may come a point in your life where you have rejected and ignored and then the consequences come. There is no guarantee he will save you from those consequences. You know, one of our own group, driving drunk, rolled his car over and killed his uncle in that car. And now he's in prison. Oh, he's saved. He loves Jesus. Jesus loves him. But he's in the big house because consequences roll on. God's wisdom cannot deliver you from the consequences. We have the freedom to choose what we will and what we won't do. We have the freedom to ignore God's wisdom, but we have no freedom to choose what consequences we get and what consequences we don't. That's in somebody else's hands. And that's the point being made here. You think you're in control. Maybe, maybe not. So in verse 28, then they will call on me and I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despised my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. People eating the fruit of their own harvest, right? You've been planting. Now reaping is going to happen. Oh, I've been planting in the wrong field. I'm praying for crop failure. Well, good luck. Because God says, no, it's going to come to a harvest. It's coming up. Whatever your fancy was, well, that's what you're going to end up eating, was whatever your fancy was. It's going to come back. For the turning away of the simple will slay them. Notice this. It's not God. God doesn't slay them. It's their turning away. I don't need that. I don't want that. That means nothing to me. And it's the complacency of fools that destroys them. Oh, he'll be fine. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. This is the whole warning. If you fail to heed his wisdom, then there can come a place where you will be left to your own consequences. The consequences of your foolish choice, of your arrogant thought. There's that line that can be crossed that there's no turning back. There's no getting back away from, from, you know, this downhill slide that you've decided to take on. It's that turning away from God that slays you. It's that arrogance that says, I don't need it. Now get this. Sin doesn't keep you out of heaven. We've always got to keep this in mind as Christians. Good works can't get you into heaven and bad works can't keep you out of heaven because heaven is going to be filled with sinners saved by grace and hell is going to be filled with self-righteous people people we thought man they are good people but never came to Christ as Lord and Savior never accepted It's Christ's redemptive work. It's, have you been redeemed? That's the scoreboard. It's not where you are in good works. It's not where you are in bad works. That's, that's nothing. 
It's have you come to Christ? Whoever listens, whosoever listens, that's a wide open door, isn't it? Whosoever, that's anybody. Whosoever listens in order to yield their ear, in order to yield their time, in order to yield what they're doing, will dwell safely, will be secure in this place and have peace. Not scared of the knock on the door. Not scared when the cop is running up behind you with the red lights flashing. You do, oh, he's got me. You don't fear when the boss calls you into his office unexpectedly. Like, man, I must be getting a raise. I've been great. Not, oh, no, here it comes, pink slip time. You know, the highest point of rejecting wisdom is when you reject the cross of Christ. The absolute pinnacle of God's wisdom is the cross and Jesus on it. Salvation stands right there for the good and for the bad, for the evil and for the righteous. But if you choose to ignore it, if you choose to walk by it, if you choose to have your own wisdom about how I'm going to get there, I've got my own way to get there. Matter of fact, when I get there, I'm going to give God a little piece of my mind. You better hang on to that. You're going to need all the mind you can get. You're headed to a Christless eternity. That's the definition of hell. No Christ. And just think about what Christ is. Christ is light. So you're going to a place with no light. Christ is fellowship. You're going to a place with absolutely no fellowship. Christ is peace. You're going to a place with no peace. Christ is hope. No hope. Christ is love. No love. Everything that Christ is, you're going to a place without him. Without that. It says in 1 Corinthians 1, it says, For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. God's foolishness is wiser than all of man's wisdom put together. To reject that is to plunge yourself into everlasting destruction. You see, it's not God sending you to hell. It's your choice to walk there and reject the antidote. There is no redemption from the condition of someone who just won't hear about Jesus and dies in that condition. There is no second chance. There is no other hope. This life is for one purpose, for you to receive Christ. That's the ultimate purpose of this life. Oh, it's to learn lessons. No, it isn't. Oh, it's to be a good person. No, it isn't. The ultimate purpose of this life is to find Christ. He's not lost. You are. If you sit here this morning and you haven't accepted God's wisdom, his ultimate purpose for you. He came to save the evil. That defined me when I got saved. He came to save the lost, the sinner, the blind, the lame. He came to save me and you. And that offer is wide open. Can I suggest you take care of that this morning? If you come up after service, we'd love to pray with you, answer your questions if we can, give you a Bible. You know, I'm not here to collect your offering from you. I'm not here to get your name and address so we can pester you. I'm not here to give you some religion. I'm here to open the door to Jesus and eternal salvation. Can you hear wisdom crying out to you? 
I suggest you listen. Listen carefully. Father, Lord, I'm excited about this book. I'm excited to get into your wisdom, the practical application of truth. And Lord, we know that your word is truth. So Lord, open our hearts and open our minds. And Lord, let us be excited about going through this book and beginning to walk differently, beginning to make different choices, other choices, even coming to that place where we change our mind about you, about your word, and about our lives. Lord, we praise you that you continually, even being rejected and rejected and rejected, every day you show up and whisper into our hearts and into our lives. Lord, thank you for being so, such a hound, the hound of heaven just barks and pursues us constantly. Thank you for that. I wouldn't be saved if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for you constantly drawing. Oh, that we would be reconciled to you, Lord, and have that hope of eternal life in you and in you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On that night with his disciples, you got to think about those guys, right? Got Peter, a guy who constantly was saying things he shouldn't say and doing things he shouldn't do, sticking his foot in his mouth, only removed the foot to put the other one back in, you know? You've got John and James, the sons of thunder, wanting to nuke them all and let God sort them out. You got Thomas, the, the doubter. You've got a zealot. You've got this whole group of people, a lot like us. They're all over the map. And Jesus that night, he breaks off a piece of bread and he passes it around and says, break yourself off a piece of that because that's my body. This is going to represent my body to you. And not just the body that I've walked with you for the past three and a half years, but the one that's broken and hanging on that cross and then gets back up and will walk with you and empower you the rest of your lives. That body. That's the one I want you to think about. That's the one I want you to partake of, right? That's what communion is. It's, it's a celebration of being able to partake of Jesus welcoming him in. God, give us power. Give us wisdom. God, thank you for dying for me. God, thank you for all that you've done. And Jesus sits there and gives thanks to the Father. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can give these guys this. To remember me, to empower them, to walk with them, to encourage them, and Lord, to keep them. And that we pray that same thing. God, would you do that in us this morning as we partake of you? And then he takes that cup, and he sends that cup around. And he says, would you all get yourself a swig of this juice? wine, whatever it is. You know, ours is just juice. Too cheap to buy wine. I don't want it. Um, but he says, because this, this represents my blood, not just my blood, my blood in the new covenant. What did he come as? The lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world? How did you sacrifice a lamb? You took its blood. You drained its blood out. And he says, this being drained out of my body here in the next day, If you partake of it, it will totally wash your life. Totally. But you have to stand there by faith, don't you? Well, I'm still a sinner. I still blow it. I still do stupid things. But his blood still washes. It still cleanses. It still washes me white as snow. Aren't we thankful for that? Can't we look up and say, oh God, thank you. 
for sending your son in human flesh, God in human flesh, come down and hang on that cross, be brutalized, bleeding out of seven parts of his body there on the cross until it was all poured out there on the north side of the cross, all of his blood drained into the ground. Why'd he do it? For me. Because he knew I needed that blood. He knew I needed that cleansing. He knew that I could never get to God without a righteous and holy and perfect sacrifice. And he became that for me. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done just to drag my worthless hide close to you. So now I have access with you. I have peace with you. I even have joy in your presence. Now your word comes alive to me. Now I'm, I'm the light of the world. You were the light of the world, but now I've partaken of you and I've become the light of the world. And now I get to shine and tell everybody I know. You know this Jesus guy? Amazing what he's done for me. Amazing. Oh God, thank you for doing all that you did for your creation, us, your people.